Hello, and welcome to Audacity with Ayantu and Siade. Here at Audacity, we bring you informed and diverse conversations on the most contentious issues. Audacity is a forum for deliberation, fresh ideas, and critical thinking on current affairs. My guest today is Yadisa Bojia. Yadisa is a multimedia artist, humanitarian, and a civil rights advocate. He was born in Ambo, in Ethiopia, and now he lives in the U.S. In this conversation, we'll be exploring the relationship between his art and his activism. Yadisa, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for you and Siade for starting this uh, wonderful podcast and um honor to be on it. Thank you. Can we begin with a little background about you and your work? When I was two years old, my father, uh, Obozo Ogoboja, was killed by the government at that time, so we have to come to um, Addis or Infine. So um, I lived all my Ethiopian life uh, mostly after two years old in, in the capital city, um, Mercato area. And so most of my awareness about um, what it means to be an Ethiopian, what it means to be an Oromo, is informed in through um, where I lived and through the life I lived. <clears throat> and I came to the United States in 1995, and I've been here for the past 20, 21 years. Wow, that's a long time. Have you gone back recently? <laughs> Last time I went was in 2005 uh, to get married, and uh, and in 2010, uh, because I was uh, invited by the African Union. So the last time I went was in 2010. Oh, okay. What did you do at the African Union? Well, there was an international competition to design the African Union flag that represents the continent. And uh, there were like 126 um, designers from around the world that competed, and I won the design. So I went over there uh, to hoist the flag with the uh, heads of states. Oh, awesome. So I knew that. I just wanted to hear the story again. Um, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> but, um, you know, you said something about how where you, how, where you grew up influenced um, you in thinking about what it means to be Oromo, Ethio- Oromo and Ethiopian. I want to come back to that as a point, but let's, let's talk a little bit about your father. Um, can you tell us what you, I know he passed away when you were very young, but what have you learned about him from family members? Well, um, there is a whole lot uh, that's um, written and uh, told about him because he was uh, an influential person at this time. He ran for uh, representing his, his um, district, which is, I think, the uh, Western Shaw. Um, and he presented him in the parliament for almost uh, three terms. I'm guessing it's like more than 12 to 15 years um, in the parliament. And um, he was an advocate for a lot of people and um, to the farmers, the farmers right. He uh, started uh, asking a question about Oromo rights and Oromo farmers' rights, which is almost kind of parallel to what happened today in Oromo protest. Hmm. Um, so him and his colleagues get together and they organized uh, the Mecha and Tulama Foundation. <coughs> now, some of the people at that time was uh, Conrad Adam Gitesa, um, Haji Adam Sado, and um, Mamo Mazama. A whole lot of uh, stories and things. The wonderful story of them is written on the book called Gizit and Gizot, which is written by my, my uh, wrote by my brother, uh, Oboa Yela Olana Zoga or Yela Zoga. So he basically, he's one of the people who actually stood up and um, ask a whole lot of rights about him, almost right. Uh, he's basically finally getting killed um, for it. And so he also lived it, struggled it, and, and sacrificed life for it. So the Macha Tulema Association was, is sort of thought of as one of, one of the first or one of the early um, institutions for Oromos. Can you talk a little bit about what the legacy of the Machatulema Association has been like? Especially when we are um, talking from today and going back and see the story uh, and uh, some of the things that happened, we, um, we always have to remember that this started in uh, the early ages at the time when the uh, Machana Tulema was organized. Some of the questions that actually um, we have today are almost similar to what happened at that time, and the sacrifice they uh, they they went through is also the 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 starting point where 
um, today the young people are picking it up and uh, get to what it is. So they can be the first people that actually raise this very um, important question about rights in Ethiopia. I was going to ask this later, but since we are already got into it, I, I might as well now. What I wanted to say is you come from this r- family of human rights advocates and people who clearly like believed in organizing themselves and fighting for their rights. Given that you know that history and you're, you're related to that history, what do you think is the relationship between what people are pushing for or fighting for um, or fighting against now uh, and what people were fighting for back then? Like, what connections do you see? What issues are the same? What issues are different? Well, the, se- the central part that, that unites all of these struggles is the human rights question. Um, at, even at that time, uh, one of the um, Ethiopian was mostly a feudalistic system at that time. So um, the farmers get a land, um, uh, and and you know they basically work for the landlords, and the landlords will get this. Um, uh, it's almost like trickle down economy, but from bottom up. So so those questions were not fair, and there was a whole lot of human rights violation. Uh, uh, legal land grabbing and uh, the taking of lands from people from different areas coming without uh, respecting the culture or, uh, or the places. Even if the extent is different, the the main question is almost similar. Mm. Uh, what makes um, the the thing that we have right now different from that time was um, it's just like um, the only way I can describe it is um, this uh, what we have right now uh, is like almost like um, an overdrive of what happened earlier. It's like now there is more killing, more um, human rights violation, and more guns, and there is a blatant kind of uh, prosecution of people just because they are homo. Um, you know, it was there before, but it was not to the extent what happened right now. So the question is always the same, but the extent and the degree of how it's happening is different. Okay, so you lived in Ethiopia until you were 20, 21. Oh, yeah, I, w- I graduated college and I worked for a couple of years. Then. Okay. So I, yeah, I lived, I lived uh, long enough to know what's going on in Ethiopia. Okay, and then you, you've been living in the U.S. And so you, like, have you been having a lot of contact with the diaspora here? Like the, the larger Ethiopian diaspora and also the Oromos? In the time oh, yeah. that you've I, been, I, I have I have a relationship with everyone actually. Yeah. Uh, um, so then, based on like from what you see, what are you know a lot of people recently um, during the protests have been talking about solidarity between um, Ethiopia's two biggest groups, the Amara and the Oromo, and but uh, I think solidarity is great. But people haven't been really talking about what that solidarity looks like. Because, like you said, when Oromos gather, we hear this hegemonic voice saying, well, why are Oromos gathering alone? So what does solidarity look like to you between these diverse groups? I think that's a very good question. First of all, let's just talk about how we get to that unity. We didn't get to that unity. People who are um, in a political... um, um, People are protesting on political and, and diaspora are not the ones who created that. People back home who are actually going through the problem, who are actually going through the pain, made that happen, not, not political elites. It's very important to, to know that. The first time we see that happening is when people in um, Gondor come out and say, um, um, the almost uh, blood is our blood, the almost pain is our pain. But they didn't get there. Uh, overnight, they get there almost nine months later after they see what happened in Oromia and also happening to them. So basically, it is actually um, I like the way it happened because it happened in a very true sense of it. But the problem is, people in diaspora or politics people, they did not get there through the same process. They get there for their political gain um, to um, create some, you know, uh, all of a sudden. We'll see people just get together without understanding what they are about to do. But people back home are still in the same place, and they understand because they're going through the pain. There is a unit. There's something that unites them. 
um, the pain and the struggle unite them. But most of the people in diaspora, that's why their, their love is really shallow. And um, either way, they were not um, founded on a very solid background. It's because they didn't, they didn't get there through a real discussion, a real struggle. Rather, they just get there because they see what people did back home. So um, I'm hoping that what happened in the past month or two, where you see a little bit of um, um, confusion and a little bit of um, uh, love kind of winding down a little bit, um, will give them this really good wake-up um, uh, moment so they can understand that what the people in back home gave us is more valuable not to be um, um, not to be kind of cheapened by uh, simple bickering and back and forth. So we see that the diaspora has a lot of uh, voice in the context of um, people back home not being able to write, activists not being able to access the Internet as they were earlier on. So the diaspora really has become important in shaping the story about this movement, right? So, uh-huh. so for me, I think it's so important to look at that because what story is the diaspora telling about these movements, uh, the Oromo protest movement and the, the Amhara protest movement? What stories are you hearing and do you think it's representing what people are fighting for back at home? Well, to tell you the truth, it's not. Um, for example... The past, um, I don't know if you see it, a couple of w- weeks ago I, I released a video um, talking about this important point. One of the reasons um, when they closed the Internet, they closed the media, they shut the country down, um, our voice and our unity have to double here in order to uh, basically speak for the people who don't have a voice right now. But what happened is we got into this un- unnecessary bickering and most of the people start talking about groups between each other, he answered her, she answered him, or this and that, uh, we forgot we are a little bit off of the game, off of the what's important. So it's very important that we, as in diaspora, it doesn't matter who we are, Amara, Oromo, whoever we are, Konso, whatever it is, what we need to do right now is go back and speak about what's happening in Ethiopia. We need to be a voice for the people back home. We need to uh, tell things that they can't tell. Um, so we need to continuously um, uh, inform people. So, for, for example, they shut the Internet. They shut the, the, the social media. But we can also uh, find a way to get information out. For example, um, to three or four, uh, uh, I think in November 1st or 2nd, there are three siblings that killed in RC, um and there are three brothers killed the same day. And the reason why we're not seeing it on social media that much is because we don't have a photo, we don't have the story come out, but we know what happened. So um, we're trying to do some graphics and stuff just to show what happened. It's a very important time right now to put aside our differences, no matter who we are, and focus on what is important to stop the continuous abuse of human rights in Ethiopia. For example, we just heard that after they passed the state of the emergency, the government just said that they arrested 11,607 people just this month. Just imagine, 11,607 people are arrested. And um, they are arrested because they're suspects. And a country, a government that suspects 11,000 people um, and just similarly arrest them cannot be given a right to um, continuously um, um, suppress the voice back home. So we need to continuously speak. We need to continuously raise these points. Um, so what's important right now is taking the message out. What is not point, uh, important right now is talking about historical context and going back and forth trying to bicker between ourselves. Not, um, we're not going to resolve those problems uh, back home by doing that, but we solve it by continuously speaking for them. And I think that's a very important thing we need to do right now. So, you know, the Oromo protest marked one year, and you're, yes. one, you're one of the people who've been paying close attention, you've been translating um, things from Amharic to English, um, you've been, you know, following it uh, this past summer, 
you made an installation at Osa commemorating those who lost their lives in Ethiopia during the protests. Um, can you tell us a little bit what that process was like for you, making that you had hundreds uh, of people's pictures, uh, people who passed away, really graphic pictures. What was that process like, working through that? Well, uh, to begin with, you know, this is the most depressing thing I ever did. And um, and it's not just because of me. It's anybody who sees those pictures will be depressed and will be saddened by it. But also it's very important that we continuously talk about these people, continuously uh, uh, talk about their the, what happened back home, the amount of arrests, tortures, harassments that's happening every day. Um, and um, even after I presented in Osa, the number just doubled. And I, was, I just did a presentation to Seattle Oromo community here um, about the yearly anniversary. And uh, we were talking about how the numbers are growing and doubled. Um, yet, uh, the world is kind of uh, desensitized to our problem. And we need to continuously find a creative way to bring it back, uh, forward and talk about it. And one of the things that I'm, 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 I'm very uh, much uh, asked the, the diaspora community is to help people who uh, people like me and artists and all those things, you know, um, not just uh, not financially, but uh, just support to so we can use our voice, our work to show um, the news in a different light. Uh, for example, um, if someone died in Ethiopia and we show it on social media, it's a news, but then they forgot about it. But artists and uh, people like you can show it in different light. We can highlight what that days mean. Uh, for example, right now I'm working on um, a song about the Recha, um, and and you know we we can show what it that mean in different light. So those are a, a kind of things that's open to us that the social media, even if it's taken from us, even the media is taken from us, even if the <clears throat> voice is trying to uh, be suppressed, we can still use so, those talents to show. And um, I, I personally, I'm doing um, the collecting of information because um, it's very important that they uh, we remember those people who died uh, because their life uh, don't have to be in vain. Uh, we have to learn from the problem. You know, I personally lived through uh, the drug time, and you know, we all ha lost a lot of people. But uh, the same thing is repeating itself in these governments because we never actually dealt with what happened and actually talked about what it means, what kind of effect they have mentally, socially, economically, what kind of problems these uh, killings and this torture, this uh, culture of destruction brings to our country. And we need to actually discuss those things and learn from them by that we can actually heal a better uh, and create a better world for our children. I think that's that's such an important point. When we think about the Horn of Africa and when we think about Ethiopia, there is a tendency to frame things in binary way. It's this or it's that. And we, uh -huh. we are very hesitant to explore the way systems, you know, the way people are positioned differently in these systems and the way that they are hurt by the system you know like uh -huh. take authoritarianism authoritarianism has shaped the history of ethiopia throughout and it has impacted so many people's lives i mean even thinking about the people who fought against tyla selassie and then who fought against the dirk their lives still to this day are so shaped by that very ugly violent history and they really haven't had much opportunity to process, to talk, to to sort of have a closure, you know. So like their trauma, to me, it feels like it's still kind of hanging over us. And so like we do need to heal from that. Um, I agree with you. Exactly. And, you know, like um, a person, uh, unless you dealt with something, it, it, it tends to repeat itself. Yeah. And um, history is a perfect way of learning from something, you know. Um, Basically, what we were going through right now, the state of emergency, the killing, the, the harassment, all of these things happen at that time. Mm -hmm. All of them. And people can debate about the extent of it. People can debate who's doing to who. But it all happened. The problem is 
they have to have some kind of dialogue. They have to have some kind of understanding and learning from errors. So we don't keep on doing this circle of ignorance and circle of um, hate. Basically, that's what's happening in Ethiopia right now. If you really think about it, um, if a person, a child died in Gambella, we all have to be in pain. If a, a, a child died in uh, an Ambo, we all have to feel that pain. But that's not what's happening in Ethiopia right now. One of us died, another one danced. One of us being shot, another one laughed. And it's like the same thing that happened before. And why is that kind of lack of respect to humanity happened? It's because we are trained to think that way. And we never dealt with our problems from back home, um, uh, from back the back days. And so uh, we, we tend to do the same thing. So let's say we get rid of this government. And are we going to be the same? Are we going to do the same kind of killing and the same kind of harassment of other people? No, we don't have to be that person. We need to actually need to learn from our errors, learn about this, and make this a history not to be repeated. And that's why I'm really focused about this. It's not just because the people who are uh, going through this are this and that. We have to understand that human rights have to be respected regardless of who we are. So it's very important to me uh, personally. And um, What do you think? Uh, I was in a... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Ask me. Uh, what do you think is the role of the artist in helping us, one, heal from the the trauma of the history of violence from which we all come and uh, second in helping to create bridges between different communities that have been positioned against each other or that share a country that share a region but haven't necessarily always been in dialogue with each other yeah go ahead. I, I think you 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 said very important thing which is Actually, you just talked about what is the biggest problem that we're waiting for us. Um, one of the biggest problems that's waiting for us is uh, the diversity in Ethiopia and how we tend to deal with each other is very important. For example, the Oromo people showed um, how amazingly um, uh, great and respectful and um, very... Um, uh, culturally, what the word I'm looking for, very uh, culturally centered and and um, genuine people it is, by not focusing on revenge or trying to harass other people, even if people are being killed on a daily basis. So that is something that we need to actually celebrate. We need to talk about. We need to say, look at these people, a group of people that actually went through all of these problems, and they taught us something. That's why I really always showed my about that our painting because I feel like our culture is centered in um, injustice and doing right rather than in being uh, venomous and being revengeful. Uh, so that, that's what makes all my people very different and very um, respectful. So we are actually proven that showing exactly we can do that. So people can actually learn from that and also um, and going forward, how can we make this culture that we have um, actually more universal, more other people can learn from it? Because what we're seeing right now is uh, an utter disrespect to the other people um, and killings and um, being um, deaf to people's cry and being um, not seeing people's tears. And it's very important that we all understand that we live in this world and we can be um, our brothers keepers and our uh, sisters keepers. So it's, it's really important for an artist to find that and spread it out. And um, I'm using my art through that. If you remember when uh, the Ormo protest started, when I do the Abagada painting, um, I wrote an article called, you know, the moral, uh, the, moral the arc of the uh, moral uh, uh, justice um, and that's basically uh, taken from Martin Luther King's speech. And, it, you know, it's bent towards justice no matter how um, much pain goes through it. At the end of the day, uh, a person with, a, with justice, with righteousness, will win. So uh, we continuously have to show that and focus on something that's 
makes us stronger, makes us united, rather than makes us something that separates us. So I think artists have a very special um, uh, opportunity to do that, and I'm doing that too. We've had so many government changes, but the same thing keeps happening. Uh, you know, exclusion of groups, violence, land grab, and, you know, suppression of dissent and the whole works. Given that we keep reproducing this cycle, or given that this cycle keeps reproducing itself, what do you hope will be different this time? What's your hope for for the region? I actually think Ethiopia never get a chance to have a democratic system. Never get a chance to have a democratic system. In any history, if you see it from whatever time to this day, um, a democracy system is based on people's voice, based on people's um, 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 right to vote, right to express themselves, this basic human right. And you tell me if there is any government in Ethiopia in the past that actually did that to its people. We don't find any. Actually, now we are getting to the extreme part of it in which people are accused, not because of what they did, but who they sat across. Um, I just saw um, uh, an article from Ethiopia where um, they, were con- uh, they were really questioning if uh, Dr. Maragudina can be uh, arrested because he sat be- uh, beside uh, um, Dr. Brown Naga. And I'm like, how did you even get to this point where people be accused of not what they did, but where they sat. So it is, um, we never have a government that have democracy. We never have a government that have a, a moral code or uh, a foundation that everybody can lean into. What we have is governments can, and a special interest, uh, take the, uh, from the time of the crown, take the time of the military government in the dirt, and now the, the Yanis. It all comes to benefit certain groups, not the people. So what we need to do in the future, um, if we are lucky in our, in our lifetime, what we need to see is a system that's founded on the core values of democracy, the core values of uh, Ethiopians having a right to decide the future of their own countries, not parties, not militaries, not um, generals or, or creators. What we need is peoples having a right. And to do that, I think, honestly, we need to build our, uh, our democratic institutions, our courts. Um, um, but, how are we, but how is that going to happen if the system remains essentially the same? EPRD have really, in a lot of ways, inherited the same sort of thing, right? Because when you, when, when you go back and look at some of what happened in the cor- in the courts under Derg, and then you look at what's happening now, in a way, it's it's like it's almost worse in some ways, or the similarities is mind-blowing. And so you wonder, well, what does it actually... And I'm not asking you to answer this. It's just something that I wonder. It's like, what does it take to transform these institutions, takes, these systems, I, you know? I actually think it takes genuine interest from people to seek change. And... What I'm saying that is basically we are told or we are actually tuned to follow party systems. For example, let's say I have a party, okay? Let's just forget everybody else. Let's say I have a party called Alva or, 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 or whatever. And then I'll take that party, get a follower, get everything. And then when we get to the power, we never consider the country. We consider the party. Mm. That's, for example... That's what uh, what Yanis did, right? When they came in, they considered the party. They considered their party. Even now when you talk to them, when you actually talk to them about democracy, about what it means to rule a country, they will finally answer you when you put them throughout all the way, they push them to the wall. Their final answer is, if you really want to change it, get a gun and fight for it. That's what they will say. Why? Because they believe in ownership of a system not being a system that not being inside a system of people oriented system so it also comes down to um having a leaders that have a vision the ingredients of building a real democracy are not in ethiopia never been in ethiopia so we have to actually the young people who are listening or young people who are thinking about this need to think that they are 
not as big as the country. The country have to be what's in the forefront of building rather than their political party or wish or things like that. So that's why we're seeing all these problems. I think people have to uh, use their voice and um, focus back in, in Japan, people that are going through a problem right now rather than any political things or uh, what happened here or there. The most important part right now is for us to use our voice and speak about the families and the people that are going through these incredible and draconian laws. And uh, we have to use all our power to change that. Um, and I also wanted to commend you and Tiade um, for giving me a chance to speak. And I'll, I hope I will speak to you guys again next time. Thank you, Yade, sir. I appreciate you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Audacity podcast with Ayantu and Siade. If you have ideas for the show and or suggestions for guests you'd like to hear, please let us know. You can email us at the audacity with double A at gmail.com. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at the Audacity Podcast. Audacity is brought to you by Dagali Media and the Underground Media Collective. 